in the New Testament in your pew Bibles under the heading, The Transfiguration. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for they were terrified. And then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice, This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. From Life in These United States in the Reader's Digest, uh, TF via the internet says, I'd never had surgery and I was nervous. This is a very simple non-invasive procedure, the anesthesiologist reassured me. I felt better until the person continued, heck, he continued, you have a better chance of dying from the anesthesia than the surgery itself. And Katie O'Connell from Warrenville, Illinois, submitted this. My husband was water skiing when he fell into the river. As the boat circled to pick him up, he noticed a hunter sitting in a duck boat in the reeds. My husband put his hands in the air and joked, don't shoot. The hunter responded, don't quack. And uh, from the political side of things, William Whitelaw, a British politician, said this. He has been going around the country deliberately stirring up apathy. Oh, my goodness. Would you pray with me this morning? Oh, God, may the words of my mouth, may the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. O oh God, you are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Have you ever met someone famous? If yes, then think about that encounter for a moment. What were the circumstances? How did you react? I've met some famous people. I met Roger Tory Peterson, uh, mostly thanks to my wife, who's somehow related. And we had a lunch together. He was a brilliant man, very focused on his life of birds and capturing them in paintings and drawings. And I found him to be remarkably humble and normal. Despite his great reputation, he was very much a common man. Years later, I would participate in doing his funeral services, and he was a remarkable man, but he was still a man, and he still died. I met Sandra Day O'Connor, and we had a lovely conversation about the way of the world. When we meet someone, he might be starstruck, maybe awestruck. Maybe you would not be able to come up with anything intelligent to say. Maybe you would stutter or tell a bad joke. That's kind of my MO. <laughs> Maybe you would be speechless. Maybe you met them and you said something utterly foolish, something that you regretted the moment the words came off your lips. And immediately in your mind you're thinking, why did I say that? 
How silly. We are in this year of 2021 going to have a year-long theme and see how that plays out. The theme is moving from fear to faith. Moving from fear to faith. Uh, this covers a lot of ground for us. It shows the direction we plan to be moving in this current season of the pandemic, which is still ongoing. For all of us, that movement may take various actions and reveal various things about us. But the one thing I know is it's going to be a process. It's not going to happen in an instant or in the moment. We're all human, and this is a process, and it's going to take some time. Moving from fear to faith. In that encounter with a famous person, would you say that you had fear? Did you have terror in the meeting? I don't mean just a startled response or, or a surprise response. Uh, I came around the corner the other day and nearly bumped into somebody. and I was like totally surprised. But I'm talking real fear. Have you had a true fear experience? Today we celebrate not just Valentine's Day, but also the Transfiguration. Now for some people that that fear or terror was about the first time you met your sweetheart. The first time you had to go up to them and speak to them and ask them out. Some people have terror when they meet that attractive or handsome person. They get sweaty palms. Uh, you begin to perspire and your mouth goes dry. You have that fight or flight response and most of us, you wanna run away. But you're caught, you must make some polite conversation, the adrenaline kicks in, and there's no telling how the conversation is going to go. Jesus was teaching in the area around Caesarea Philippi, it's in the north of Palestine. He was telling them some hard stuff. If you look at the verse 1 in our chapter 9, truly I say to you, he says, there are some standing here who will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God come with power. Then as Mark does very often, he jumps us a week from that time in teaching. He just jumps a whole week. And Jesus is taking three disciples with him, Peter, James, and John. Why these three? Why? What was so significant about those three? Well, some scholars call them his inner circle, uh, who were closest to Jesus, or perhaps most devoted. Might be simple that they were his first called and had been with him the longest time. We don't know why he chose those three, but they all go up that mountain. Going up the mountain is significant. They're going apart from the other crowds, the people that continually clamor after Jesus' time and energy and miracles. They are going upward, closer to heaven. And of course, the mountaintop is often the place where God would meet his spokesperson. Moses met God in a cloud on Mount Sinai. Elijah went to the mountain cave when he felt threatened by the evil king Ahab and the queen Jezebel. And here today, Jesus went up to meet God, his father, on that mountain. Possibly Mount Hermon, they're not sure. The three disciples were accompanying Jesus, Rabbi and Messiah, when his appearance was transformed, transfigured, until he shone brightly. I've got a picture for you to look at. The idea of metamorphosis is here. Like when a caterpillar uh, sometimes 
strange-looking worm changes into a beautiful butterfly with wings. There is a metamorphosis that happens. The word used to explain how he looked was used of, of burnished bronze or the dazzle of bright sunlight, perhaps sunlight off of the snow, which can be blinding. He was so bright they could scarcely look upon his glory. That is what they were seeing, the glory of God revealed in the Son of God. And standing beside him in that cloud of God's presence were two figures they only would have known from the study of the Old Testament, Moses and Elijah. I do not know how they identified them. Maybe their robes had embroidered names on them. Or maybe somehow they just knew in their hearts who these two people were. Our Bible says that Peter spoke up out of nervous fear. Really, he was terrified. The three were seeing a sight they could not explain, but simply stand and watch with open mouths. They were terrified, exceedingly terrified. And yet Peter, the one disciple who never lacked for words, suggests building three shelters, three little shelters to commemorate this significant event. Seems perfectly reasonable, right? This is an event they did not have any warning about, an event where their, their master, the rabbi, the Messiah, is having a conference with two powerful Old Testament individuals. Chief of the law, the lawgiver himself, and chief of the prophets, who never saw death, but rose to heaven in a flaming chariot. Wouldn't you love to be in on that conversation they had? To be a small bug in the dust at the feet of Jesus when he met Moses and Elijah and was brilliantly transfigured to look as white as a star, like he was wearing a thousand watt halogen spotlight. What do you suppose was spoken? We get no record of their conversation. Nobody was close enough to hear or they were just so stunned that they couldn't record it. And later, Jesus would tell them not to even mention what they had seen until the Son of Man should have risen from the dead. A statement they would not understand at the moment. In fact, they were very confused by it, very puzzled about it. The marvelous thing about this miraculous event is that Jesus does not answer Peter. Who was it that answered? If you look at verse 7, a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice came from the cloud. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. Listen to him. The Father, God, made his voice known and his direction to pay attention to the Son. We think about those other times when God spoke audibly. Jesus' baptism. As he came up out of the water, the voice came down as the dove descended, the Holy Spirit, like a dove. And then in John 12, 27 through 33, again, God spoke to the people. We can read that. Let me find that. I thought I had this all prepared. And I... Reading from John, John's Gospel, chapter 12, 27 through 33. Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. No, for this purpose I have come to this hour. Father, glorify thy name. Then a voice came from heaven, I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd standing by heard it and said that it had thundered. Others said an angel has spoken to him. 
And Jesus himself said, answered and said, This voice has come for your sake, not for mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the ruler of this world be cast out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. These intersections of glory came at significant times in our Lord's life. Significant intersections as he was moving to fulfill his mission on the cross. I find it interesting to look at what Peter wrote about this event many years later when he now understood uh, many of those cryptic sayings of Jesus because now he had lived through the crucifixion, the death, the resurrection, and seeing Christ raised up into glory. Peter had betrayed Christ and then been forgiven three times. He had moved from fear into faith. Second Peter 1, 16 through 19, he writes, for we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father and the voice was born to him by that majestic glory, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. We heard this voice born from heaven for we were with him on the holy mountain, and we have the prophetic word made more sure. You will do well to pay attention to this as a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. The vision of Christ transfigured on that mountaintop stayed with John and James and Peter all their lives. It was literally burned into their minds and into their memories. And it certainly impressed upon them the glory of this man they were following. He was not an insignificant rabbi from Nazareth, but the Messiah, the son of the living God. As I prepare to close for today, let me share with you the legend of St. Valentine from the Benedictine Sisters. St. Valentine was a Roman Christian who according to tradition was martyred during the persecution of Christians in the third century. So they estimate his death was around 270 AD. But prior to his death, Valentine was imprisoned. He continued to witness to Christ in prison. And one day a prison guard, a good man who had adopted a blind girl, asked if Valentine's God could help his daughter. Valentine prayed and the girl was given her sight. The guard and his entire family saw this and then they believed and they also were baptized. Upon hearing this, the emperor was furious that Valentine was continuing to make converts, even in prison. And so the emperor sentenced him to death. And the story goes that just before being led out to his execution, the young Christian wrote a note to the jailer's daughter, signing it, From your Valentine. The source that I, that I looked up said that the first Valentine was really a Christian witness to the unconditional and compassionate love of God. But I would suggest that Christ himself was the very first Valentine from God to humankind. He wanted us to understand how much he loves us. The depths of his love will never extend, will even extend to giving us his own son, a loving sacrifice to cancel our sins. I remind you of that verse that many of us learned as children, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave 
his only beloved son, so that all who believe in him will not perish, but will have eternal life. And so on this Transfiguration Day, on this Valentine's Day, think about that Valentine. Christ gave his life for our sake. Would you pray with me? Oh God, we are grateful. We are humbled that Christ was willing to, to do that for us. We thank you for it. We thank you for that gift. Going beyond life to eternal life, that you have saved us from ourselves and from our human condition, and from the sin that we can't escape. And yet, you provided a way. Thank you, God, today. And I pray that if anyone has not received Christ, they would do so today. And simply invite him to come into your heart. Invite him to come and make a way to become Lord in your life. And simply to pray, Jesus, come into my heart now. I need you. I'm sinful. I need your forgiveness. I need your grace to fill me. And I pray it in the name of God the Father, Christ our Savior, and in the power and presence of the Holy Spirit. Amen.